I'm going to paint a scene for you. Uh, it happened a while ago, um, and it left a pretty serious impression on me. So give me like maybe a minute or two to paint a picture. Um, so I am in a very large auditorium, <laughs> and there's a lot of music playing, and the music is increasing in intensity. There are people around me, everyone around me, keeps standing up and walking towards the front, and I'm still sitting down. I hear a man's voice, and he says, why don't you come up? Everybody else seems to be answering the call except for me. At some point, I can't take the weight of the peer pressure anymore, so I get up, I walk towards the back, I go into a little dark room where there are three men who stand over me and say, are you ready? So at this point, I'd like to ask for a little audience participation. Would anyone like to take a stab at where I was, the setting? Anyone? Sure. You're good. <laughs> you guys, fundamentalist Christianity is some scary shit. <laughs> so this was a conversion experience. Uh, I probably laid too many clues along the, too many breadcrumbs along the road, but uh, this was a conversion experience when I was eight years old. And as you know, eight-year-olds, while we can fart in our pants, uh, <laughs> cannot make serious decisions like what they want to do with the rest of their lives. Uh, and I was eight years old, and there was a lot of weight placed on me. So there were some funny things that led up to this experience. There were some very serious, dark moments that led up to this experience. The problem with this entire moment is that my parents, everyone around me, my peers, uh, my church members, uh, my fellow uh, young people ranging from five to 14 years old, um, and most importantly, my parents took this as some sort of written commitment. They believed that this was some sort of pact that I had made and that I could keep forever. Um, and they went to great, great lengths to enforce this. My mom showed up on my college campus to spy on me. Uh, she was a little disappointed when she found me drinking out of a red Solo cup and wearing just panties at a college party. <laughs> Needless to say, she took those as a sign that I had definitely fallen far from the uh, straight and narrow path. Uh, but they tried to keep this commitment to me and to this day are very disappointed. And they keep saying, this is a promise you made. This is a promise you made. Um, and that has definitely stayed with me in, in many, many, many ways. Um, but I, I think what's so interesting about it is people tend to forget a little bit of cause and effect, and every great story starts somewhere. Um, prior to eight years old, when I had this experience, I had a lot of things happen to me uh, that definitely made me susceptible, uh, made me vulnerable to saying, yes, I will do what everyone around me who's 40, 50, 32 years old is agreeing to. Uh, some of them are funny, so let's start, let's add a little humor into this equation. <laughs> so things like, uh, for example, when I was six and came across the word sex. We lived in Hollywood, not sure my parents chose to live in a den of sin when they wanted to uh, be Christians. I guess they thought the challenge was greater. Uh, but <laughs> we saw a billboard for a uh, sex store, and my sister's like, Mom, well, what's sex? And my mom says, well... It's when a man and a woman, obviously, uh, <laughs> join together under the watchful eye of God. And I've looked back on this, and I'm like, God, that's really, really kinky. Like, I don't understand that definition. And I've tried later on in life to sort of wrap my brain around that, and I'm like, okay, so maybe, maybe God, Mary, and Joseph were the original poly triad. Uh, how nice of the father and stepfather to cooperate in the raising of the child. Uh, or maybe, you guys, maybe Joseph was the original cuck. Uh, <laughs> and I'm going to leave that one right there because this isn't a stand-up comedy routine. <laughs> However, uh, I look at those things, but then I also look at very serious things, like when my little sister passed away of meningitis in the span of three days, and rather than grieve, rather than go through the ritual, my parents uh, had a funeral sponsored by the church, uh, and her gravestone said, God gives and God takes away. That will certainly leave an impression on you. Uh, then when we went to bed at night, uh, my mom used to not sing us a comforting nursery rhyme, but she used to say and sing a song uh, to us, if I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. That's definitely going to scare the shit out of any human child. <laughs> All I could think, I'm like, I don't want to go to sleep. I don't want to go to sleep. 
Um, so when I look at this now and I look back on that moment at eight years old, it took me a very long time to realize that I wasn't actually disobeying my parents, that I wasn't, in their words, rebelling. Uh, that by making a choice when I was such a young child at such a young age that I'd never had the mental, emotional capacity, but also the knowledge, the information, uh, and the education to be able to make choices for myself. Uh, that you know, I was every great story again starts with some form of coercion, and I definitely did not have the agency or the choice, um, and that's how I've forgiven myself. Um, so the haunted moment of sort of being forced into decision that wasn't my own uh, has finally been relieved. So thank you guys for listening. Let me share. Thank you. Thank you.